Hey yo, what up Wisecrack? Chris here to talk about one of our favorite releases of 2020, Supergiant's acclaimed underworld adventure, Hades. Now, at first, the game seems like a regular old dungeon crawling bout of mindless fun in which you befriend some gods. Oh, what's good there, cuz? Uh, who am I kidding? We can cut the small talk. I don't mind. I interrupt my brothers and sisters all the time. And slash your way through the underworld. But what if the game's roguelike mechanics are actually making a super deep statement about how to get through life? Just have to try again. We'll explain in this Wisecrack edition on the philosophy of Hades. And of course, spoilers ahead. But before we get into it, I want to tell you guys about our podcast, Show Me the Meaning. It's where we geek out over the minutia of our favorite films and the occasional TV show or video game. This month, we're doing a totally unseasonal retrospective on the work of Horror King, John Carpenter, director of iconic films such as Halloween and The Thing. Join our hosts, Austin, Ryan, and Raymond as they talk about their favorite Carpenter films. You can catch the live stream of the podcast on this channel, so make sure you're subscribed and have notifications turned on. And if you miss the stream because of school, work, or something else absurd and pointless, check out the recorded episodes on our second channel, Wisecasts. Subscribe to Show Me The Meaning on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you kids get your podcasts these days. Episodes come out every Friday, so make sure you've got a way to tune in because why would you want to miss out on the fun? Unless you hate fun, and if so, why? Anyways, back to the show. And now, a quick recap. In Hades, the player takes control of Prince Zagreus, the rebellious heir to the underworld's throne. Sick of living under his father, Hades' thumb, Zag is determined to fight his way up through the world of the dead and make it to the surface. Along the way, the player receives messages and power-ups from Zagreus' extended family on Mount Olympus, all of whom are eager for him to make his escape and join them. But no matter how many lightning bolts or love charms they arm him with, Zagreus' endeavors always end with him trudging back out of the pool of blood to be greeted once again by his sneering father. Stupid boy. I told you nobody gets out of here whether alive or dead. And even when he does make it all the way to the top, it turns out he can't live for more than a few minutes on the surface, so each run really is doomed from the start. Guess I'm just a little tired, that's all. Not accustomed to the weather, as I think you call it. And even after you make it to the top enough times to complete the main story, the end credits roll with Zagreus underground right back where he started. You can keep playing beyond that, but the 100th run is guaranteed to end pretty much the same way the very first one did. So is the game just trying to make us lose our minds, or is it saying something here? Well, we think we can figure it out with one particular inhabitant of the underworld and his favorite pet boulder. Sisyphus, how can you stand it being here like this? You always seem in such good spirits, though. You push old Boldy here sufficient times and you might get a different outlook on things too. That's Sisyphus, from the Greek myth about a crafty king who found a way to cheat death and, as punishment, was forced to push a boulder up a hill for eternity. As an extra touch of torture, Sisyphus could reach the top of the hill, but the boulder would promptly roll back down. Bleak. In the game, Sisyphus emerges as a sort of central philosophical presence. His repetitive, futile rock pushing neatly mirrors Zagreus' own doomed endeavors. Like Sisyphus, the player goes about their quest, only to inevitably start right back at the bottom of that hill. And even when you seem to have made it to the top, or outside of the underworld, you, like Sisyphus, are inevitably dragged back down. Again. Perhaps uncoincidentally, Sisyphus is foundational for the philosophy of French novelist Albert Camus. The writer uses the king's plight as an allegory for human life. Sisyphus pointlessly exerts effort that will ultimately amount to nothing. He has no higher purpose, no meaning, just a futile existence. Now, you might be rolling your eyes at me right now because respawning and repetition is just a basic component of almost every video game. You're like, Chris, if I play through Skyrim enough times, am I too doing a Camus? But Hades is pretty intentional in making this game mechanic a central part of the narrative. It's not just the repetitive respawning, but the constant sense that the game is messing with your head. For instance, you escape the underworld, only to realize you can't survive up there. Then, the metaphorical boulder is rolled right back down the hill. And then, the game asks you to escape again and again. And when you finally beat it, there's still no rest. Zagreus realizes he has to endlessly escape, die, and rise again from his pool of blood as a means to distract the gods. At the same time, he continues to test his father's guards, almost like a security consultant for the underworld. And sure, we might get some experience points or get better at the game, but are we just some version of Sisyphus growing faster and stronger as we push our boulder? So why even try? Well, let's look at in-game Sisyphus. As he and Zagreus bond over the shared futility of their endeavors, Sisyphus reveals that he has accepted that this pointless boulder pushing is simply his lot in life. 
or death. Save those sympathies for someone else, your highness. I could be Prometheus, spending an eternity having my liver coupled up. In this acceptance, he finds contentment, happily going about his task without ever expecting to achieve anything by it. This, it turns out, is the concluding statement of Camus' essay. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. The point for Camus is that we live in an absurd world, one where our trials and tribulations, whether reuniting with our mother or showing up for work on time, are as pointless as pushing a boulder up a hill. At the same time, we can, and should, find joy in this absurdity. And by and large, Zagreus conducts himself with the same cheerful attitude as Sisyphus, poking fun at various enemies he encounters along each run, and generally enjoying his fruitless tasks. Get back in the magma and no one gets hurt. Unlike many games, enjoyment in Hades comes less from winning and more from just embracing each new attempt. Thanks to the generally excellent design of the game itself, the player gets to share in this enjoyment. Armed with a host of different weapons or borrowed powers, playing as Zagreus still feels fresh, even on the 50th run. In the game, Sisyphus seems so happy that even after Zagreus finds a way to free him from his servitude, Sisyphus decides to keep pushing his boulder anyway. I located the contract binding you and bought it out. It's null and void. You're free to go. Oh, indeed. Then does this mean, Prince, then the Fury Sisters, they won't come around as often anymore? Not just that, Sisyphus. You can make your way someplace else where other decent shades reside. You know, somewhere with fewer chains and torture devices and such. You're much too kind to this old soul, Prince said. The thing is, this is home. For me and Baldy, it is what it is. Now, unlike his French peers who favored existentialism, Camus didn't think that we should actually seek meaning within our meaningless world. Like in-game Sisyphus, we should accept our meaningless exploits and find happiness in our pointless boulder pushing. Of course, that's not to say that Zagreus' story is just about going around in circles. Hades isn't just about accepting our fate. While its basic premise seems to be Camus' myth of Sisyphus, it doesn't share the writer's total rejection of meaning. As Zagreus wanders the underworld, he encounters a number of mythic figures who have fallen into a kind of nihilistic funk. Characters like Orpheus and Patroclus who are too heartbroken to care about what happens to them. It's that I've lost my muse, my friend. It isn't harder to explain than that. Have you not had such moments in your life where you had lost the will to chase your passions? By emphasizing the importance of forming connections with others, Hades shifts away from Camus' belief that life is essentially absurd. Zagreus' relationships offer him the chance to find meaning that goes beyond just sitting back and laughing at the futility of it all. To see how, let's take a look back into in-game Sisyphus. Because in Hades, Sisyphus hasn't just embraced the fact that he can do nothing but keep pushing that boulder, he has embraced the boulder itself, naming it Boldy and treating it as a cherished friend. It's basically the deepest bond we've seen between man and inanimate sphere since Castaway. It's the warm companionship he finds in his rocky friend, and then later with Zagreus, that allows him to endure and even enjoy his fate. Does Boldy really keep you company? Personally, I would resent the giant boulder that keeps tumbling back down a hill after I push it all the way up there. Oh, Baldy's not so bad. I mean, he's a good listener, a good shoulder to lean on, doesn't wield a whip. I rightly can't complain. Good having company down here. Even after Sisyphus has been freed from his contract with Hades, he chooses to stay where he is so he can keep hanging out with Baldy and the prince. And if I were to leave, why, we would not be having these exchanges now and then. I happen to enjoy them quite a bit. As the game goes on, we learn more about its wide cast of hellbound characters as Zagreus grows closer to each of them. While every run ends with Zagreus being stripped of his new powers and forced to start again, more or less from scratch, the progress he makes with each new friend remains, allowing him to strengthen these connections over time. And as they open up to him, he encourages them to break free from their depressive state by reaching out to those they love. Dusa is a prime example. The ever-nervous Gorgon is tasked with cleaning the entirety of Hades' house, trapping her in an impossible endless cycle of work. The prince can't do much to lessen her workload, but by befriending her, he's able to encourage her to find some joy in life. You've been so kind to me, and I'm glad we've had a chance to get to know each other more. It's really nice sometimes, knowing somebody really cares about me here. The same is true for all of Zagreus' friends down in the underworld. They can't escape their situation any more than he can, but the connections they build allow them to create a kind of community, which gives everything a sense of meaning. These aren't just your usual side quests or romantic subplots, where the hero pours gifts into an NPC until they give him a new item or agree to sleep with him. The process of forming relationships is really at the heart of the game. 
The backstory makes this clear. The reason Zagreus starts ransacking his father's kingdom in the first place is because the growling patriarch refuses to bond with him or tell him anything about his parentage. This leaves Zagreus feeling alienated, randomly dropped into a world that seems to have no meaningful place for him. So he starts out on his absurd quest to reach the surface, mostly as an act of pure rebellion, a way of laughing in the face of his prescribed fate. But when he makes it to the top and meets his birth mother for the first time, his quest becomes about reconnecting with her. From then on, he is willing to walk through the fires of hell again and again for the chance to spend a few more moments with his mom. Tell me something. If you knew that you could only see Persephone for but a moment's time, would you still make the journey to her there? Yes. Yes, I would. So maybe this really is a story about the friends we make along the way. And while that can easily sound a little too cheery for a game about hell, there's some depth here. The idea of social bonds being one of our best solutions to an existential crisis is pretty well established. In fact, it goes all the way back to Aristotle, who saw friendship as a vital part of any well-lived life, claiming that in poverty and other misfortunes of life, true friends are a sure refuge. For existentialists like Jean-Paul Sartre, working together presents our best hope for overcoming the alienation that plagues us all. So sure, Zagreus might not be all that different from Sisyphus, but at least he has his friends and family as he endlessly battles his way through the underworld. While the world of Hades is a long way removed from our own somewhat doom-filled domain, the sense of going around and around on the same hamster wheel can be uncomfortably familiar, especially in recent lockdown times. And the atmospheric visuals and slick gameplay alone could ensure that battling through the game's beautifully crafted hellscapes would stay entertaining for a long time. But Hades achieves a deeper sort of resonance by depicting Zagreus as a godly being facing down an essentially human problem. Hades presents life as an absurd game where we can only defy death for so long before we end up in the red, but it does so without abandoning hope altogether. Zagreus' quest becomes bearable because of his dedication to those around him who are toiling together under the same absurd punishing circumstance. Steady your resolve and find her there again and use well what brief time you have with one another whilst you can, as mortals do. But what do you think, Wisecrack? Should we stop overthinking it all and just enjoy the Thunderbolts? Or is there a deeper reason that Hades has struck a chord with so many players? Let us know in the comments. Big thanks to our patrons for all your support. Smash that subscribe button like it's Theseus' big smug face, and don't forget to ring that bell. As always, thanks for watching. Peace.